pray that I pray that uh, angel comes right in their camp and unlocks the doors and they sneak out during the night. Uh, pray that they honor Jesus before all else. Pray that they. Pray that the Christians would be a witness to ISIS. We've talked about that on Thursday night. Many, many examples of, uh, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you have an opportunity to read that book, uh, persecutors of the church becoming Christians themselves as they see the way Christians died with love and with faith. So pray for their faith to remain strong, that they could be a good witness even to their captors. Uh, and Yumi said, well, why don't we fast? And she meant for our family. And I thought, well, why don't we announce a fast this week for the church? Now, uh, I would like to fast on Tuesday if that doesn't work for you or if you can't because of health reasons, whatnot. But if you've never fasted before, it's not just like building up a store of magic because you're not eating. What it is is you don't have to prepare meals, you don't have to eat meals, you don't have to clean up after meals. And your hunger focuses your mind on, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be praying. Uh, so it's an opportunity to remember to pray and we're going to take Tuesday for a mini fast. Uh, sometimes, uh, like a Jewish fast might be sun up to sun down. And so we decided to have a skip two meals on Tuesday. So it's not a, a big fast. It's a mini fast. But it will give you more opportunity. It may, may just remind you, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be praying. And there are people who are in far worse situation than I am skipping, skipping my supper or whatever. And so Tuesday, we're going to have a mini fast wherever you're at, whether you're at work or at home. Uh, go ahead if you want to join in and, and don't eat. If, diff if that day doesn't work, choose a different day during the week. Uh, and if you can only go one, I don't know what medical reasons or whatnot, whatever the case may be. But uh, join in the rest of us praying, and uh, that'll be on Tuesday. And you me, I thought that was a, a wonderful idea. So our church is going to be fasting for the Christians held by ISIS this, uh, this Tuesday. I don't know how D got a tan back there. Oh, yeah, maybe it had something to do with Jamaica. Good night, sister. It was like a huge Danielle gap in our church while you were gone. It is so wonderful to have you back. It just feels right. I'm really excited uh, to begin the Gospel of Luke. In fact, the Gospel according to Luke. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. I don't know if we'll get through all of them there or not, but you can uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke. <clears throat> this is uh, when people first become Christians and they ask me, What should I read? I always direct them to Luke and Acts. Uh, Book of Luke, I think, this is a phenomenal gospel. I encourage uh, seekers, people who are just learning about Christianity, that are open to the idea, maybe there's a God, maybe this is all real. I said, start in Luke. Luke's purpose here is to introduce people to Jesus. And even uh, when Christians, maybe they have, they've never gotten the habit, they've been a Christian all their life, as long as they can remember, they've never gotten the habit of reading their Bible. Don't start with Genesis, this is a good place to start right here in Luke. This will explain your faith. And, and you say you're a Christian, you follow Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? Well, we have got a lot of things going on in our mind, things our parents taught us maybe, things we picked up on television or radio or picked up at church or Sunday school. This book, Luke, was written so that we could know Jesus. And so as a church, we're approaching this today. Lord God, please we want to love your son more. We want to know about uh, your son, Jesus Christ, more. We want to know about your purposes, how this all came about. When we started the book of Matthew a few months back, I said, let's imagine that you are a first century Christian, maybe early second century Christian, one of those first generations of churches. And you're in a house church, probably, and if it's a beautiful day, warmer than today, although today's beautiful, if it's a beautiful day, you might be down by the river with your church, or you may be out in a courtyard or underneath the shade of a big tree. 
but also it's very likely that you'd be uh, in a building, and if it's early or late, there'd be candles uh, lit. Usually the men would sit on one side, the women would sit on another side. Quick, no. I thought that was funny. And so you'd be in this church, and now listen, everybody believes in Jesus, but you don't have the, Bi the New Testament yet, right? Your scriptures are the Old Testament, and then you're passing around some letters from this fella named Paul, used to be Saul, who used to persecute the church, and he encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ. Needless to say, that had a huge change in his life. That had a big effect. And he went around, and he was beaten, and he was shipwrecked, and he struggled to tell people that God is real, this message is real. And he would write these letters to different churches. And the letters would be copied in these churches and sent out to other churches. And so you'd get a new letter, and that'd be so exciting. Well, Paul's letters came early on. And then uh, one of the first Gospels was, and it's debatable, remember we talked, it's either Matthew or, or, or Mark. And for a long time the church believed that Matthew was written first, and that was written, uh, you know, very detail-oriented. And then Mark wanted a rapid-fire, like, pamphlet form. And so it's a kind of a, reda it's a short, shortened version of the Gospel. Recent scholarship, a lot of people think it went the other way around, that uh, Mark probably dictated to by Peter, that's what the early church said. Uh, Mark wrote down his gospel, and Matthew, who was an apostle, remember Mark wasn't, but Matthew, said, well, that's all true, that's a good core, but I'm going to add some more. And so he added around the book of Mark. But either way, those two books, it's kind of like neck and neck. One of them was, was early on along with uh, Paul's write letters, okay? But then quite a bit later, quite a bit later, you have this fellow Luke come along, and he writes a gospel. Now, modern scholarship often says that he wrote this between uh, 80 and 90 A.D., which would be uh, maybe around the same time that John was being written. John, obviously, the last of the Gospels that's been written. I don't really know if that's true because the reason they say that is because we don't have a lot of uh, quotations from it until early in the second century there. So that, that's good reasoning. It can't be too much older than that if we don't have it quoted from. But the thing is, is Luke never refers or indicates that he understood that the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. That was a huge event in history. There's really, we think, we think from our modern perspective, oh, that's because he's trying to make it look old. No, when you're writing when there's still eyewitnesses around, there still would have been eyewitnesses in 70 AD anyways, 70 AD, AD, 90 AD. If you're writing uh, at that time and you know there's eyewitnesses around, there's no reason why he wouldn't have said, maybe, maybe, if this was God's will, you know, that the temple is destroyed and Jerusalem overrun because they just crucified Jesus Christ. Don't you think that would have been a powerful message if you're making it up to put it in there? So the fact that they don't indicate at all the destruction of the temple, don't it, it, they make it seem like the life, temple life is still going, even the book of Acts, they don't indicate at all uh, the, the, wipe, the destruction of Jerusalem, it seems like it was probably written before the Romans did that. And so to me, it doesn't seem like there's a, a, a good reason to think that it wasn't because if it was written after 70 AD, it's almost definitely uh, would have been included in there. So I want you to imagine today that you are, again, late first century, early second century, first, second generation church, and the book of Luke comes to you for the first time. You've already had, you already have Matthew and Mark, unless you just were late getting your letter, getting your, your scroll or whatever. This probably came before John, so you don't even have John yet. You have some, but not all, of, of Paul's letters. And this Gospel of Luke arrives, and this is an exciting one. This is an interesting one, because it wasn't written by an apostle. It's not like Matthew. And it wasn't even written by Mark, who was probably with the apostles, John, if he's John Mark. Uh, Matthew was a well-known apostle. Mark, uh, probably John Mark, there's some debate, but probably John Mark, was possibly one of the 70. Remember, Jesus had the 12, but he also had the 70 that he sent out by Jesus. And, and if this is the right fellow that we're thinking it was, he was a, a cousin of Barnabas. Remember Barnabas, son of encouragement? When the whole church didn't believe that Saul, Paul, really became a Christian, they were worried that he was like, you know, the secret police, he just wanted to infiltrate them to, to, to capture them. Barnabas went and talked to him, and he came back and said, no, this guy is a real believer. He's changed. He believes in Jesus. 
And so that's probably where Mark came from. Now Luke is different. It is very, very probable that Luke is actually even a Gentile. And so that's exciting for this early church. If you're a Greek believer, you want to hear it from this ears. And if you're a Jewish believer, wow, God's even bringing this gospel to us through, through a Gentile. Uh, whereas Mark, remember Mark, he was always and, and, and. It was rapid fire. A lot, want to show this action. Jesus, in Mark, we see Jesus as a servant, a suffering servant. As a servant, he's always busy. He's going to do this, then he does that, and he does this. Jesus uh, coming as a servant. Uh, Matthew, he's, he's seen as bringing the kingdom, and he's the king. Uh, whereas Mark seemed to be the t uh, target's audience was a Roman audience, and he uses some Latin phrases in there not found elsewhere. Matthew was obviously written uh, with a Jewish audience in mind, and Matthew writes to Jews as a Jew. Mark and, and Luke sometimes explain things in Jewish culture. Well, we read that and think, oh, yeah, because we don't know. But if you think back, this is very early in the church, and they're trying to explain Jewish culture to these first few Christians. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Luke seems to be have written for Greeks. And so you have something targeting the Romans, something targeting the Jews, and now this third gospel, it's definitely targeting the eastern side of the Roman Empire in the Greeks. Some stats and interesting facts. And uh, you know these are reliable because I got them from Wikipedia. 41% uh, of Luke is uh, information also found in Matthew and Mark, 41%. 23% is information found in Matthew, but not Mark. 1% of Luke is found in Mark, but not Matthew. And 35% of the material in Luke uh, that Luke collected uh, was not found in either of the other Gospels. Uh, Luke and Acts together actually make up most of the New Testament. So everybody always thinks Paul is the main writer in the New Testament because he has so many books. But if you combine the bulk of Luke and, and Acts together, it's, uh, he's the most prolific writer. He, he, wrote, uh, the most, uh, he was the most verbose of the, of the New Testament writers. In fact, uh, Luke and Acts, at different points in the church, were considered one long book, and they just come together in one book. There's Luke-Acts. Luke also, and this was interesting to me, I don't think it means much, but it was less popular in the early church than Matthew or or even uh, John, because those, again, were written by apostles. And so you have Luke coming along, and he's not even Jewish. He was an apostle, and he didn't, uh, probably never met Jesus Christ in person. Uh, still, Luke and Acts were circulated among the churches more and more, and people always think, you listen, common mistake people make. They think some people sat around together, and it was dictated from on high, maybe the emperor or somebody said, here's what the canon will look like, and then the canon became authoritative. That's not the way it happened. What happened was uh, all these different churches got together, they sent a representative, and they all came with what we believe is scripture in our church, what is already authoritative. They got together, discussed the books that are authoritative in scripture, and there were some good books like uh, Clement, First and Second Clement, that was written very early on in Christianity, uh, the Didache, possibly even written by the apostles, but it wasn't determined that these things are supposed to be in Scripture. And so it wasn't dictated from on high. They got together, and the churches mutually de uh, de uh, together decided what is already authoritative, and Luke was obviously an authoritative piece of work, uh, and everybody knew that this belonged in Scripture, and I believe that was the working of the Holy Spirit, obviously. Uh, so it was, it was put in the canon without doubt. There was never a doubt that Luke should not be in the, the canon of Scripture. He, is an, he writes this as a historian, almost like a detective. Luke is going to interview people. He says he's going to collect a bunch of information. So he, he, he had uh, Mark and Matthew, but he also had other information. He had living witnesses, and there were other records written that we don't have today. And he was probably getting all of these together in oral tradition. Uh, in, right there at the beginning, he records the life of Jesus and then he goes and records the birth of the Christian church for us. I'm so thankful to God that he stirred the heart of this Gentile, probably, he could be a Hellenistic Jew, probably Gentile believer, who recorded the life of Christ for us in such a detailed manner. And then he says, and here's how the church starts. This is beautiful. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes people see that as a weakness because, well, this one's targeted at Romans, this is Greeks, this is, and this one talks about this. Why does this one talk about this? You have, a, you have an apostle, and then at the end you have John, another apostle, as an old man. So you have a young witness apostle, an old witness apostle, 
Then you have a guy who is probably one of the 70, but not the inner core of the 12, but traveled. And then you have a guy who, uh, who was uh, friends with Paul and who was able to interview and talk with many of the apostles but never met Christ himself. And God said, my son is so important, I want you to see him and understand him from all these different angles. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a good, God could have given us one gospel, right? But instead he gives us different authors written even in different decades so we could get this full picture of who Jesus is. Again, I can't imagine a better way to start, to, to, to have the New Testament than to have the core of our faith, Jesus Christ, God in flesh, have these different gospels hitting at him and talking about him from different angles. Uh, Luke, we can tell in his writing that he was highly educated. Uh, remember in the Old Testament, maybe you guys remember, we were saying that Jeremiah, he writes like a country bumpkin. I mean, his writing is just poor quality Hebrew. And then you have Isaiah, and he writes some of the most beautiful. He's poetic. It's, and even in the English, even though it's translated in a different culture, different language, you can see that come through. Well, in the New Testament, some of the Greek is not that great. Luke has some amazing Greek. In fact, Greek scholars say some of the most beautiful, uh, one of the most beautiful books ever written is the book of Luke uh, from a language perspective. And then you have Paul, who loves his long, wordy, run-on sentences, and Luke. They're both obviously highly educated, and they got to travel together. And I think that's cool. Highly educated. Luke was curious by nature. That's why he says, I want to investigate all this. He heard it, but he says, i got to find out more. I got to find out more. So he goes and he talks to the first-hand witnesses. He wants to talk to eyewitnesses. He's, he's trying to collect all this information about Jesus. It's not just enough to hear it. He wants to learn even more. Uh, he was a doctor by profession. Some people think he was probably, at one point in his life, a slave. Many doctors were employed uh, not to work the fields, but as doctors by rich families. You know. Uh, again, he acted like an ancient detective, researching, collecting information. Uh, Luke was an eyewitness not to Jesus' ministry, but he was an eyewitness to Paul's ministry. And uh, Paul calls him, uh, he was a friend of Paul's and a traveling companion, Paul calls him the beloved physician. And you can just hear that as a term in, of endearment. Luke, the beloved phys physician. My buddy, the doctor. Uh, and boy, Paul needed a doctor to travel with him. <laughs> I, I just thought that for the first time this week. God supplied Paul with a doctor to travel with him. Because he's always getting his head cracked open and bleeding and being beat up. And wasn't it good for him to have a doctor to travel with him? These two men, again, were brilliant. I'm sure they enjoyed each other's company. And if you look at the book of Acts, it starts off, the first like, part of the book of Acts, Luke is just talking about what Peter did, what Barnabas did, what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Paul did. But then from Acts 16, it's very subtle. It's no, there's no big flashing lights. Look at I'm here now. But from verse chapter 16, you start to see him say stuff like, and then we went, and we felt, and we thought, and then he's traveling with Paul from, from that point on. Sir, there, this is just a neat story I came across. Sir William Mitchell Ramsey, uh, a British archaeologist, uh, had a critical attitude towards the scriptures. He was kind of a product of his times. He was doubtful. He was educated, uh, part, of the, part of the elite. He, he got all sorts of awards and, and badges for his work in science. He decided to study Luke and Acts as a skeptic. And he actually traveled to Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, where a lot of the action uh, of uh, Acts takes place. And he wanted to prove that the Bible was unreliable because that's what guys like him do. And he actually went and he thought, if th he thought Luke and Acts, this is probably late creations, and if it's 100 years after the fact, uh, he's not going to have his history right, and I'm going to be able to prove him wrong. And so he went and he found cities where they were supposed to be. He, he, he found things that, that measured up, and he was so impressed as he was studying through Luke and Acts and he, all of his archaeological finds that after much study, actually years of study, he concluded you may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians, and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. Incidentally, he became a Christian, which is really cool. So Sir William Mitchell Ramsey, uh, appreciate what he did with that. All right, let's look in uh, Luke chapter 1 now.
And uh, I listened to a message from a fellow I, d I don't know, but he's on the board of uh, he's on the board of uh, of Samaritan's Purse, and he's friends with uh, Franklin Graham and and some others. His name is Pastor Skip Heitzig, but he had some cool insights that I've borrowed some of those from today. So Luke chapter one, first four verses. We'll look at this. So you're sitting in that church. Maybe you're down by the river. Maybe underneath the tree. Maybe in a dark room with candles, and you're all together. Maybe you sang a hymn together. You open up the book of Luke and read it for the first time. Here's how he starts. And he starts it, incidentally, just the way uh, Greeks wrote their histories. Here's what I'm doing, and here's my mythology. Here's what I'm about. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So we know that there were other accounts of Jesus we don't have those today, but this one uh, still remains because it was ordained by God to be in Scripture. Many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Like, he's not talking about this happened 2,000 years ago. The people in that room, he's saying, we've all heard about these things that were fulfilled. God's will being fulfilled right down there in, in Jerusalem and Judea. And people have been talking about this and writing about it. Uh, many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And uh, the word eyewitness here is uh, autoptes, autoptes. It's the word that we use when you examine a dead body, an autopsy. In other words, it's a, it's a medical term, and he uses more, I heard, more medical terminology than even the father of medicine, uh, Herodotus. So he uses medical words all the time. He used that, I did an autopsy on all the information. Uh, I did, uh, the eyewitnesses here uh, got down to the basic information, talked to the eyewitnesses and servants. And the word servants here is also a medical term. Uh, it's huperetes, and it means under rowers. So if you think of a Roman trireme or a galley, the people are rowing along. It means you're working like a team, you know, you're working together underneath a master. And if you were a rabbi, you'd have disciples, and the Greeks would call these huperetes. But if you were a doctor and you had interns, they were called huperetes. And so he said these ministers, they were interns of the word of God. They were interns of the, of the word of Jesus Christ. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I, too, decided to write an orderly account for you, most ex excellent Theophilus. Uh, Theophilus, if you see the word theo in there, is God, and uh, phileo is, is a friendship. Uh, it means friend of God, and there's some debate among scholars. Most excellent Theophilus, uh, Theophilus could be a man named Theophilus. You know, people's names meant something. Even if it was a literal person he was writing to, if you were sitting in that church, you, you would have just heard to your ears, I carefully put this all together for you, dear friend of God. And that's the way you would have heard that, uh, even if you thought it was an actual person. So either this is, he's written it to a specific person that was copied and sent out to their churches, or he said, I'm writing this for all the friends of God, all the people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is for you, because I want you to know the truth. And I studied it from the beginning, investigated everything from the beginning so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Does anybody want to say thank you, God, right now? Isn't that a great, uh, we, had, we had Matthew, awesome. We had Mark, this fast, rapid-fire one. They had its purpose, too. And now we have this beautiful book of Luke that's written by a guy who said, I really want to get down to it, and I want to investigate it all, and, 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 I, and, and talk to the eyewitnesses in and he says, I'm, I've investigated all of this so that you could be sure. Because he said, you know, I wasn't there with Jesus. And I wanted to be sure. And I wanted to have all of this uh, written down. Okay, uh, from verse 25. I'm going to talk about John the Baptist first. And Luke gives more time with the Christmas story, with the, with the coming of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ than any of the other Gospels. So here he starts off right with this. And then by the time John comes, who writes after Luke, he just glows over it real quick because it's already been dealt with in Luke. In the time of Herod, this is Herod the Great. Remember Herod the Great was uh, teamed up with the Romans to, to wrest Palestine away from the Parthian Empire. 
So at this time, these Jewish lands are under Roman control, but just be recently before that, they were under Persian uh, control. Uh, so Herod the Great, uh, king of Judea, he was like a puppet king under the Roman Empire. There was a priest named Zechariah, or maybe your Bible says Zacharias, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands. They were faithful to the Old Testament. That's how they demonstrated their faithfulness. Uh, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth uh, was not able to conceive, and they were both well advanced in years. They were well stricken with age. Uh, Zacharias, Zachariah, his name means God has remembered. Elizabeth, possibly a cu couple different meanings I found. Uh, one is devoted to God or, or set aside for God's use. It was not a beautiful name uh, for her, and especially since she's going to be the mother of John the Baptist, so devoted to God. But her name could also mean uh, God's promise. And uh, Pastor Skip Heitzig, this fella, uh, I think out west somewhere, he uh, pointed out, and I, I don't know if this is really pop proper methodology, but it's kind of cute, it's kind of neat. If you put the couple's names together, it could be taken as God has remembered his promise. This husband and wife, their names together, God has remembered his promise. Uh, well, let's, now let's keep your finger in, in Luke, and let's turn back to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Remember what I always lie to you about? Yeah, he's the first Italian prophet, Malachi. That is not the truth. Never trust your pastor. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, 5, and 6. Everybody there? The very last words of the Old Testament. And in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have approximately 400 years where God is silent. 400 years where he doesn't send a prophet. See? I will send the prophet Elijah. So you end the Old Testament, and you're waiting for the prophet Elijah to come back. I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he, this prophet, will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And the Old Testament ends with God warning of a curse, and the New Testament ends with God saying, I'm going to wipe away every tear and there will be no more curse, which is kind of neat. So you have, you have the Old Testament ending with this prophecy that we need to be fulfilled. We need, John, we need, uh, we need uh, Elijah to come. And so now we have this old couple, and together their name means God has remembered his promise. And let's see what happens. Verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, this is kind of funny, a little background information. There were probably 20,000 priests at that time. You could not serve when you wanted to serve. You only served twice a year, two weeks a year. You'd go in rotations, and most of these priests were never allowed to go give the offering because there was just too many of them. But his uh, name comes up. Uh, it's his opportunity. Uh, so once when Zechariah's division was on duty, it was his turn to be on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, again by chance here, uh, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So everyone would wait for him. He'd, he'd give the offering, he'd come out, and he'd, he'd give that uh, blessing from Aaron. Remember the one, may the Lord... Uh, bless and keep you, may his face shine upon you. I don't know if I got that all correct. Uh, remember that blessing from the Old Testament there? And so he'd give the uh, incense, and he'd come out and give that blessing to everybody who's assembled outside. Uh, so he comes in, he's going to burn the entrance, incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. That usually didn't happen. He's terrified. Suddenly, there's a man there who wasn't there. Uh, this old guy probably almost had a heart attack. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, because angels always say that. I've got a little beef with angels, you know? They're always scaring people than saying, do not be afraid. You know what you're doing, and we know you know what you're doing. But anyways, 
He says, uh, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Listen to this. This is beautiful. <coughs> Here's an angel, which means messenger, right? A messenger from God himself. And he says, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Isn't that so cool? He got to hear from an angel. God's hearing your prayers. Brothers and sisters, God hears our prayers. God hears. He says, don't be afraid. God hears your prayers. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. I think that's neat. This old man probably had aches and pains. Everybody does, right? He's living in a fallen world. He's going to die. Everybody dies unless Christ comes back and takes us out of here. But an angel is saying, I don't have the same experience you guys do, but I understand that in your existence, having this child is going to bring you a lot of joy. Having this son is going to bring you some joy. You will have joy. You will have delight. And other people also are going to rejoice. And by the way, that includes us, doesn't it? We rejoice because of John the Baptist coming and preparing the way for the Lord. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Remember, this is the time before Pentecost. Remember, at Pentecost, or after the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would come on people and come into the hearts of all believers. So every believer has the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God would come on a prophet or a king or somebody at different times for this purpose of prophesying, come and go, come and go. But John the Baptist is going to have the Holy Spirit with him uh, from birth here, from, from right at the beginning. Uh, many, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. I'm sorry. Uh, many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. So his purpose is to bring people back because culture is always drifting away from God. And this prophet, his job was to bring people back to God. He will go before the Lord. We're talking about the Messiah now. In the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts and the parents of the parents to their children and the disobedient uh, to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Obviously referencing, uh, Gabriel's referencing this Old Testament prophecy. He's coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Today, a lot of people will say, well, Elijah didn't come back to so the gospel. You know, the f people who were alive at that time, who were eyewitnesses to all this that happened, they accepted it that John came in the spirit of power of Elijah, that that's what God meant. Maybe he wasn't a literal Elijah, and that's fine. But he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and that was a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Sometimes I think 2,000 years doesn't give us the great advantage that uh, over the people who were there on the ground that we think it does. Uh, Zechariah said to the angel, and this is just a weird thing to say, isn't it? An angel appears and startles you and gives this prophecy, and Zechariah says, uh, how do I know you're telling the truth? How can I be sure of this? You know, I'm old and my wife is well long years. Da, 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 da. <laughs> he wasn't going to explain everything, how this doesn't work anymore. Uh, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Isn't that, that's his answer. How do I know? I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. You best be believing me, son. <laughs> Gabriel is interesting because Gabriel is the prophet that appeared, I mean, is the angel, the messenger that appeared to the prophet Daniel. And Gabriel gave Daniel the message of the coming of the Messiah. And he gave him a timeline, which Rachel did a great job with once, uh, adding up all, all the time in the timeline. It came down to the time of Christ, when Christ was to be born. And so Gabriel is on one end of the message, and now Gabriel is coming at the end of the message. He, gave, he fulfilled, gave the prophecy to Daniel, and now he's coming to say the prophecy is being fulfilled. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you. And it's okay if you're a little afraid now, punk. And I will tell you and tell you this good news, and now you will be silent and you will not be able to speak, which is kind of a big deal because he's supposed to go out and give the blessing, right? You're not going to be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. And uh, so for, I think Japanese say babies take 10 months, Americans say 9 months, somewhere in between. Uh, he had 
quite a few months where his wife was getting the edge in every discussion. Um, <laughs> verse 21, uh, 20, 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. People are getting antsy. When he came out, he could not speak to him. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them. <laughs> I can't even imagine what was he, you know, what was he doing? But everybody's watching him. And, I think he saw a vision, you know. <laughs> he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. So at the end of that one week, after this, his wife Elizabeth, remember, set apart for God or God's promise, becomes pregnant, and for the five months and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. The Lord has done this for me, she said. <clears throat> in these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from among the people because <clears throat> she always wanted a child and she never could. Well, next week we're going to look at the birth of Jesus, but I, I just want us to think about how God set this in motion way back in the Old Testament, and then he has this elderly priest and in, in, in his wife who have been faithful their whole lives, doing the right things, and God chooses them to miraculously speak through them to bring uh, the prophet. And remember we said John the Baptist is often seen like the last of the Old Testament prophets. His, his ministry was very reminiscent of an Old Testament prophet calling people back except for this twist. He was setting the stage for Jesus. And so God uh, fulfills the Old Testament promise right here. And Luke, getting all the details, interviewing everybody, provides us this insight that we don't see in the other Gospels. So isn't it so good? Don't we love our Bibles? And aren't we so thankful for what God is doing, giving us all these different perspectives? I'm really excited about the book of Luke, and I can't wait uh, to look at the birth of, of Jesus. Let's uh, bow our heads close our eyes. Dear Lord, God, thank you for giving us your Bible, this love letter from you, so we could know your heart, know your will for our lives. Father, I pray that we're people who are really good at surrendering our own uh, stubbornness, our own agendas, our own willfulness, Lord. Uh, help us to be good at that and quick to pick up your cause, your mission. Help us to love people the way you love people. Help us to to see people not as, as difficulties or irritants or obstacles or, even, or as enemies, Lord, but to see everyone as someone who needs your love, your grace, Lord. Help us, Father, to be your witnesses, your ambassadors, and help us to take this message that we're studying here in our church everywhere we go. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's, he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just, uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step Leave your comfort zone at home. Uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area. And I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home. But we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So... Uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching, but if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you.
Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.